gospel is recorded by St. Luke chapter 4. And I want to begin reading with Luke chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 27. And I'll read a couple of verses to set a context for our thoughts this morning. Luke chapter 4, I'm sorry, chapter 5, actually. Luke chapter 5, look at verse 27. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. But the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, what do you, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. May the Lord's richest blessing be to his word. May we sanctify in our heart. <clears throat> Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for another opportunity to gather around your word with your people. We pray for a fresh anointing from on high that you might give us the words to speak and open the minds, the hearts, and spirits of your people to receive. And that you might give the interpretation, the clarity that we need to hear what you have to say to us. We pray, Lord, that if you please, you'd open the heart of that man, that woman, or boy, or girl has never heard the gospel of Christ, how Jesus died for their sins according to the scripture, how he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the scripture, and how they can be gloriously saved by putting their faith in Jesus Christ and trusting him as their personal Savior. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to continue our mini-series this morning from this subject of Jesus' 2020 vision. Jesus' 2020 vision. And specific, specifically from this idea of his vision for the despised, his vision for the despised. One of my favorite preachers is Dr. Tony Evans uh, from the Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship down in Dallas, and he's had great pain in his heart in recent days as his wife uh, for nearly 50 years passed away. And he's been a great blessing to many of us preachers all over the country. And I heard Dr. Evans tell a story once about these two men that were arguing over who knew the Bible the best, Brother Mike. And so one of the men said, I know the Bible better than you because I know the Bible from Genesis to the Revelation. The other fellow said, no, I know it much better than you because I have done an in-depth exegesis of the Revelation. I can open the Revelation up, the vials, the seals, the white horseman, the apocalypse. I know all about the apocalypsis, the unveiling. I know the Bible much better than you. One fellow said, I guarantee you I know the Bible better than you. As a matter of fact, I'm a Christian. I don't like to bet. He said, I bet you a dollar that I know the Bible better than you. He said, I bet you that you cannot even recite the Lord's Prayer. And they shook hands, and they had a deal. And the guy said, go ahead. The gentleman stood up straight, <clears throat> cleared his throat, and he said, now lay me down to sleep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And the other guy started laughing and grinning. He said, man, that's something. He dug his hand in his pocket and said, man, here's a dollar. I didn't know you knew the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I've learned after being a Christian for 40 years and preaching for 35 is some things I thought I knew I don't know them as well as I thought. And every time I come back to the biblical text, I'm amazed how there are things that the Lord reveals and unveils I've never seen before. And such is the case as I've been revisiting this text in Luke chapter 4 and 5, where Jesus casts his spiritual vision, his 2020 vision. After his uh, baptism, after his temptation in the wilderness, he returns to his hometown. And in Nazareth of Galilee, he goes to the synagogue and they give him the scroll. He opens up to Isaiah chapter 61. He quotes that 
messianic passage about the Spirit of the Lord been upon him, having anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor, recover of sight to the blind, healing to the bruised, deliverance to the captives, the acceptable year of the Lord. He lays it out. And that was his 2020 vision for his ministry. And as I begin to delve into the text more closely, I begin to realize that in this inaugural sermon, Jesus makes this profound declaration that the Spirit of God is upon, upon him. That is the person expiring this vision that he has that the power to fulfill this vision is the anointing, the supernatural enablement that God can bring upon men and women and boys and girls to discharge God's work, to enable us to do things that we cannot do in our own ordinary strength or power, but God works through the strength that we have, through the energy that we have, the intellect that we have, the experience that we have, to do something that only he can do in and through us, and that's the way that God operates. And then we see that Jesus delineates the purpose and the priority of this vision that he would preach, he would declare the euangelion, the gospel, this good news. The people need to hear this good news, that God was concerned, that God was a God of love, a God of mercy, and a God of forgiveness, and that God was offering salvation to all that would believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile or the Greek. And that there will be a priority, and that will be the priority. So the church must understand and maintain that as a priority. We should be engaged in good works. We should be trying to bring relief to the poor. We should be trying to visit the sick, the elderly. We certainly should be, remember those who are incarcerated in prison. And we should have a special focus on trying to help children because they're the most vulnerable people in the society because they don't have a political voice. They don't have economic clout or weight. So they cannot move the political, social, cultural, and economic apparatuses to support their best interests. But we do all of those things to create a, a platform from which to preach the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. Because we understand what does it profit, what does it benefit people if they gain the whole world of material possessions, social, political, economic, and cultural clout, if they advance technology, if we go back and forth to the moon, if we begin to live on Mars, what have we gained or benefited if we do all those wonderful things and turn around and lose our souls? And then what will we give in exchange for our souls? And so as a church, we must maintain this focus of clearly of lifting up the name of Christ in this broken, dysfunctional world in which we live, in this dysfunctional nation that we now have inherited. With all of the schisms and all of the divisions that we currently have in our country, with all of the vitriol and all of the rancor that's going on, we must remember that there is a hope for those who will look to Christ and that God can bring about healing in people's hearts and God can bring about reconciliation among people that have been estranged. We still believe and we must hold on to the hope that the gospel has the power to change individuals. And if the gospel can change individuals, then the gospel can change where those individuals live. And the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ can make a difference. And so Jesus articulates, he lays out this 2020 vision, and then he delineates the people that are the target of the vision. And it wasn't the people that you would normally think would be targeted in the vision. It wasn't that normal group. So what he does is he sort of turns the table upside down. So the people he targets for his vision are the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, the blind, the bruised, the widows and the lepers, the outcasts of the society. And there was a incredibly brilliant genius in Jesus' inaugural sermon as he cast his 2020 vision for his ministry. Because the society of his day, like the society of our day, will always orient itself to accommodate the needs of the privileged, to accommodate the needs of the well-to-do. They will control the political, social, cultural, and economic apparatus and they will always make sure it works in their best interest. So when Jesus appears on the scene in Palestine at the time of his earthly ministry, the Roman Empire, which controlled Israel at that time, they were an occupied state. It was a state that basically geared around the privileged. 
And even the Jewish culture had began, basically became a culture that centered around the privileged few. So the religious leaders, they controlled the religious and the social economic apparatus of, of the Jews. Uh, they were influential and they had tremendous power over people's lives. So Jesus comes in to say, no, there is a new expression of God's kingdom. And so what he does, he establishes on the outset of his ministry that he would be an equal opportunity savior. And so the least, the last, the left out, the left behind, the forgotten, the discarded, they would have an opportunity to be a part of his kingdom, but they would have an opportunity to be a part of his kingdom on equal footing with every other class of people. So rather than going to the elite first, and they would have created the system that would benefit them and perpetuated their wealth and their power. What he does, he targets the least first to make sure that they are brought into his kingdom and they have an op opportunity at the ground floor to be a part of this new movement. So that is very important because if you understand that he establishes the parameters of his ministry with this declaration in Luke chapter 4, you will see now he now binds himself to how he would discharge his earthly ministry. Will his demonstration be consistent with his declaration? Will what he do during his ministry be consistent with what he has said at the outset of his ministry? Now, if you remember when we looked at that particular paragraph, the religious leaders, they first marveled at what he had to say, and then once he really unpacked it and gave them a little bit of historical review, uh, how that in the past God had showed up and God had healed only one leper, a man by the name of Naaman from Syria, and that God had showed up in the past and he had only went and visited one widow woman during the time of the great drought during the ministry of the great Elijah the, the prophet, and they interpreted what he was saying was that God would turn to somebody else and not feel obligated to bless us first, that God would work with even Gentiles and not realize that we have had a monopoly on him ever since he brought up, up, up out of Egypt, ever since he gave the promise to Abraham. And so Jesus lays out the fact that you don't have no monopoly on God based on your genealogy based on your, on your past. And they became outraged over the fact that he would dare say that he was not bound to bless them and work through them regardless of how they responded to him. And so if you look at Luke chapter 4, verse 24, then he said, Surely I'll say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I'll tell you the truth, truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but none of them was, but to them none of them was Elijah's sin except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Then all those in the synagogue when they heard these were filled with wrath. They went from amazement and being impressed with what he had to say. Then we, he unpacked it and he says, you have no monopoly on God. If you don't respond to him based on his revelation to you, God will go and bless somebody else. God can choose someone else. And they were offended by that so much so they were outraged. And they actually tried to assassinate him. Verse 29, and they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the, of, of the hill on which they, the city was built, that they might throw him down over the hill. And he miraculously was able to escape. So what this particular, those verses tell us is that from the very outset, there was a peril, there was a danger that was associated with the vision that Jesus had cast that his vision would upset the status quo. It would turn it topsy-turvy. It would challenge the prevailing wisdom of the day. What does it really mean to be the people of God? What does it really mean to be blessed of God? And it would make the comfortable uncomfortable. And so from the very outset, you see that there is a peril and there is a danger that's associated with his ministry. So then let's see what ends up happening. So shortly after this incident that we see here in Luke chapter 4, Jesus then leaves 
Nazareth of Galilee. He goes to Capernaum, and he continues uh, his, his ministry. And so if you drop down just a few verse, verses, verse 38 of chapter 4, it says, Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made a request of him concerning her, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever. So now what he does, he starts now to actually demonstrate, to elucidate, and to explain what he was talking about in the synagogue during his inaugural me message a few verses earlier. He goes to and he performs a miracle there. Prior to doing that, if you back up in verse uh, 31 of uh, Luke chapter 4, he goes to the synagogue and he casts out a man with a demon. And so he shows that he has the authority, and in his vision, he has authority and he has power, and he has authority and a power over the unseen world. That was important, that he had authority and power not only over what can be seen, what is visible, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in human flesh, has authority over the unseen world, and that should give us a certain amount of comfort. There are things that we see that we can fear, things that we know that we can fear, but then there are things that we can't see. And so to know that Christ has authority over the unseen world should bring us a tremendous amount of comfort. So he establishes here he has authority over the unseen world as he casts the demon spirits out of this man and he takes authority over him and would not even allow them to speak. So it's vision, it carries power, and it carries authority. It carries authority over the demonic world, over the unseen world. He then goes to Simon Peter's mother's wife. She's been afflicted with a fever, and the Bible says he rebukes the fever. So now he has authority over the diseased world. He has authority over the physical body that we inhabit and that which we live in. Now, we, in our day and age, we recognize the fact that if a person gets sick, they should probably go to the doctor in many cases. We don't just sit around and say, well, God is going to heal me. God can work and do miraculous things without doctors, but God can also work through the medical profession, through medication. And so ever since, you know, I had my little health incident, I take a fistful of pills every day, exactly like Dr. Stanton told me to take. And I'm praying to the Lord, but I'm also recognizing that God has given the medical community wisdom and knowledge and insight about the medical physical body and how to treat it to alleviate some of his pains and ailments and to try to mitigate the consequences of some of his diseases. But ultimately, those pills that I take, they do not kill me because God keeps them from killing me. Because at best, the medical profession, they're practicing. They tell you that. We are practicing medicine. We are practicing. They tell you, listen closely what they say. It's not an exact science. We are practicing. And we practice on mice, and we practice on other animals, and if they don't all die, we did practice on humans. We practice. And so we must realize that they are practicing so we always are going to the great physician before we go to see the, the practitioner. And after we go to the practitioner, say, Lord, please don't let these people kill me in their practicing. But Jesus is acknowledging, I have authority over disease. And the church must always maintain faith and belief that God can move in situations if it pleases him. He then demonstrates the sword of his disciples, these professional fishermen. We talked about this last week. They're out on the Lake of Gennesaret or the Lake of Galilee. They fished all night. They haven't caught anything. He wants them to understand, I'm the Lord of the land and the Lord of the sea. And in essence, he was saying, I'm the Lord of economics. They were fishermen by trade. They were businessmen practicing their craft. They hadn't been very successful at it. But Jesus said, maybe you ought to listen to me. So God is a God over economics. God is concerned about the economic conditions of people on the face of the planet. 
the earth belongs to the Lord and the fullness thereof, the gold and the silver belongs to God, a cattle on a thousand hill belongs to God, and God is concerned that all of his creation, both human and non-human, are able to benefit from the creative universe. This is God's earth. This is God's planet. God placed the nutrients and the elements and everything that's on the earth, and he placed it there for everybody to enjoy, not for one percent of the people to hoard up and control it. At the heart of the Bible is that God is a God of justice, of fairness, and of equity and equality. And at the heart of that is economics. God is concerned about economic justice. Now, I believe in the economic theory of capitalistic free enterprise. It can be a wonderful uh, economic uh, theory to practice because it's designed to release the genius of individuals, to release their genius so people will be creative with ideas and they were, would, would do things and research and come up with new things to benefit everybody, but also th they can benefit economically. I'm, I'm all for that. But capitalistic free enterprise can become the worst economic system when it's controlled by a few people. And we've experienced this in this country. When the barons that were created, that controlled the oil, controlled the gas, controlled the railroads, controlled the steel factories, these monopolies were created and they oppressed the people and they concentrated the wealth in the hands of a few people. And then Teddy Roosevelt came on the scene and said, wait a minute, a handful of people can control much of the wealth. So we're back to this wealth concentration again. And so then when the Supreme Court said that a dollar is money, in essence, with Citizens United, the Supreme Court says that a dollar is the same thing as a money. Therefore, you can spend as much money as you want to control the political apparatus. And that's where we are. God is concerned about that. I don't believe we try to overthrow the government, but we try to change things where we can change things because everyone is not benefiting from the wealth of this nation. Everyone is not benefited from the wealth of this nation. So if we believe in the Jeffersonian idea that all men are created equal, endowed with their created with certain unalienable rights, among them in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what Jefferson said, and then when they created the Declaration of Independence, they said, well, the pursuit of happiness should be the ownership of property. Read it very closely. Life, liberty, and the ownership of property. Because they recognize it's hard to pursue happiness if you don't own anything. If you can't control anything, how do you experience any, any uh, uh, a bit of happiness on the earth? So Christ is concerned about that, and that's why he's concerned about the poor, because he understands that the poor will be economically oppressed unless they have a voice and a champion. So he has authority, and he shows his disciples, I can provide for y'all, trust in me. I'm a God who understands economics. Then he goes on as I kind of bring some thoughts to closure here. He has authority over the demonic world, the unseen, authority over the diseases, so the authority over physical ailments and sicknesses, authority over his disciples to help them be productive in their work, whatever their work might be. And then he demonstrates his authority over defilement, verses 12 through 16 of chapter 5. A man came to him that was a leper. And if you were to try to equate the disease of leprosy with the disease that we have today, I think the best thing we could come up with would be cancer. When you say cancer, it is just fear and trepidation that enters into the mind of the individual with the diagnosis and their family. Because there's so, so, so much mystery and that's understood about ca cancer is a whole lot of stuff. They just call it cancer because there's so many different diseases and so many different things that's going on and how the body is being attacked. And so there's no one way to try to deal with it. Every person that has cancer is different in the human body. And leprosy was sort of like that. There was a family of leprosies and it was uncurable. And the person with leprosy became untouchable. And they became quarantined. And they could not come out in the public, couldn't go to the synagogue, couldn't go to the market. They'd be isolated from the rest of the society. They would have to wear a bell or something would make noise around them. So that people would hear them coming because very often the leprosy would attack the vocal cords where they couldn't even speak. And if they could speak, 
they had to crowd unclean, unclean before they came near anyone. It was such a hideous disease. It had a vile and obnoxious odor that it would emit from the person's body and the ulcerated sores that would cover their body. And very often it would uh, attack the external parts of the body and the person's ear could fall off, their nose could fall off, digits could fall off, they'd become disfigured. So when you say a man, and no one in their right mind would touch somebody with leprosy. So when Jesus shows up on the scene and he allows himself to be encountered by a leper, he was making a statement that was incredibly profound. That even the ostracized, even those who have been rejected by the society, who have been declared to be unclean by the priest and by those who operate the temple, who had no access to religion and to worship, they have access to me because I'm a God of authority and power and I can cleanse even the defiled. Now that's incredibly important. We're talking about physical defilement here, but it also translated to them being considered spiritually defiled because they were considered to be unclean. So Jesus is saying to the people who have been engaged in the most gross, vile, immorality imaginable where they have been ostracized and cast to the side, he's saying to them, there's a place for you in my kingdom. You are still accessible to come to me and I can touch you and I can make you clean. That's why we as the, as the church must continue to believe that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. There are people that have been molested. They have been sexually damaged. They have been psychologically and emotionally almost crushed and destroyed. And a lot of times these are the individuals that basically end up sinking into a deep and a dark place and they become abusers and they become pedophiles and they become sexual offenders because things have happened to them that has traumatized them so badly. And there, in many cases, there isn't any earthly hope or earthly help. But there's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel that we must lay hold to and that's why we got to be get reconnected with Jesus with his 2020 vision because we need for him to explode in our lives and explode in our churches with the type of power that transforms people from the inside out. That demonstration is what we need to witness today in the Grace Bible Church and churches all throughout Charleston and West Virginia and all over this country because our technology cannot deliver us. The wealth of our nation cannot deliver us. All of our institutions of higher education with all of their research cannot deliver us because now we have maladies that is perplexing the most brilliant earthly mind. So Jesus says, I have authority and I have power over the defiled and I even extend to the defiled, come unto me, all you the labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you'll find rest for your souls. He's just getting started, ladies and gentlemen. He's just starting his ministry, but he's casting out his net into all of these dark places. This was important. To credential the gospel as having the power to change the lives of the individuals that the society basically has given up on. Doctor, we come to a certain point in our society that we just give up on a certain group of people. The problem with that, that group of people is becoming larger and larger and larger. And now you just can't ignore them. And they start to wreak havoc for the rest of us, but we've given up on them. They know that we've given up on them, and now we have a problem. But the church must maintain its high and lawfully perch and say there's hope even for you, and believe and trust that God would give us a special visitation. Because what a ch the church in America needs today is a special visitation of God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit, where some things start to happen where people realize maybe God really is in the church. <laughs> Y'all listen to me. Most people look at the church and people in the church, and they say basically what they're doing, they're doing because their lifestyle affords them enough money and enough resources, resources to live at a certain level. But if they didn't have the resources they have, they would be living like me. That's what a lot of people are concluding. 
And so we got to show that Jesus Christ can change people's lives. They get connected to the church. The church can disciple them and encourage them, and they can live a life and on a level that they never thought possible for them to live, not merely because they got a few more dollars, but because they have the wealth of the gospel and the spirit of God on the inside of them. Now they have intrinsic motivation that is driving them to pursue spiritual excellence, moral excellence, physical excellence, intellectual excellence. They've been driven from the inside to be all that God meant for them to be because they start believing that they are fearfully and wonderfully made by a holy and a righteous God who does not make any mistakes at all. If y'all help me, I'll be through before 515. <laughs> and y'all can make the Super Bowl party. Otherwise, y'all going to miss all the food. It's all going to be gone before y'all get there. As I bring my thoughts to a close, he also demonstrates in this 2020 spiritual vision not only the authority over demons, the spiritual and the unseen world, the disease that might rack the body, over his disciples that might be perplexed by the limitation of their skills and their ability, that he can empower them to do things beyond what they thought to be their potential. Over those who are defiled and think that there's no hope for them and no hope for them ever changing or getting any better or doing any better. But also he shows power over the defective. In verses 17 uh, through about 24 or so, you know the story, they bring the man to him that are paralyzed. And they try to get him in to where Jesus is and it's too large of a crowd, so they go up on top of the roof and they take uh, the panels off the roof and they let the man down uh, before Jesus. They interrupt the Bible study teaching, the faith of his four friends. The faith of his four friends that believe that their paralyzed friend was not a hopeless situation if, as long as they kept Jesus in the equation. Now, I'm not trying to basically suggest that because if everybody's paralyzed, it's going to get healed. We know that is not true. But there is a literal and then there is a figurative meaning to the text. And the figurative meaning is that any hopeless situation is only hopeless if we leave God out. But if we keep God in the equation, God can make a difference with that situation. And sometimes the person, the individual, may be overwhelmed by life to where they can't do much for themselves as it's a paralyzed man whose limbs are, are atrophied who's immobile, he cannot do anything for himself physically, somebody got to do it. And there are people sometimes that are spiritually paralyzed, they're spiritually atrophied, they are spiritually immobilized, and they cannot do for themselves. That's why we go through this exercise every Sunday morning, not just because it's on the program, and we have a time of pastoral and intercessory prayer. We're saying, Lord, maybe somebody is so overwhelmed, they can't even pray for themselves. Maybe their faith is so weak, they become so immobilized, they've been in a situation for so long that they cannot even muster up the strength and the courage to pray. So we stand in the gap, and we're going to be like the four friends who carry their friend to you and put him in your presence. And we're going to put them in your presence. And we're believing, Lord, that you can respond to our faith. You pray for them bad children. You pray for them bad grandchildren, them bad nieces and nephews. You pray for them. You keep on calling their name out to the Lord. I know you've been praying a long time. I know it appears like it's an exercise in futility, but you may never know your prayer might be the fragile thread. The fragile thread that's keeping them from just going out into an outer spiritual orbit where they never make it back. And sometimes your God of prayer got to be this. It has to be a hard prayer, Sister Janet. It has to be a hard prayer. It's a prayer that says, Lord, don't let them find any satisfaction in the things they're doing. Don't let them find any comfort in the things they're doing. The things they used to do and it made them feel good, make them feel bad. To drive them back from the far country, back to what they were taught and back to what they know to be right and back to seeking you. So he shows that he has the power and authority over defilement, the untouchable, over the defective. And then lastly, and I'm going to take my seat, 
He shows he has power over the despised. Verses 27 through 32. The Bible says he's, he's walking by the receipt of customs. And there's a tax collector, a publican by the name of Matthew. And he's doing his job. He's collecting the taxes. He's extorting the people. He's overcharging them. He's collecting for the Roman government. Then over collecting what he can put in his pocket. He's a turncoat. He's a Jew that's in cahoots with the Roman government. He's the most despised profession in the land. And Jesus walks by the seat of custom, and he says to Matthew, also who's referred to as Levi, he's read his heart. He knows that in all of this exhortation and all of the benefits that he's procuring from robbing from the people, the luxurious lifestyle that he's living, he's really deeply ashamed and miserable. And Jesus walked by the table and said, follow me. Follow me. And the Bible says that Matthew dropped this stuff. And this has to be powerful because the Jewish brothers and African-American brothers, we just don't leave our money for just no reason. I'm sorry, we just ain't going to walk away from our money we done worked for and labored for, and it's hard to come by, hard to come by. And the Bible says he got up and he walked and followed Christ because he knew that he has what I'm looking for. Can I be forgiven? Can I get in God's kingdom? And I done turned my back on God and on God's people, and I've been a part of the Roman occupation. I've been a part of the economic and political exploitation of the people. I brought hurt and pain to the people. Is the hope for me? And Jesus says, yes, follow me. Because the only prerequisite for salvation is for you to be a sinner. If you are a sinner and you acknowledge it, then you are qualified to be saved. And that's why Paul said that Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am Chief, I was number one, Paul says, an injurious person, persecuting the church, hauling people off uh, to prison, giving my uh, approval of people being stoned to death, Paul said, but I did it all in spiritual ignorance, but when God found me and turned me around and put me in his kingdom, I'm eternally grateful for him. The people that will be the most grateful to the Lord and the people that will serve God the most sincerely and the most aggressively will be those who understand what a deep, dirty sinner they were. So Matthew got up, and he followed him. And what's the first thing that Matthew did? He threw a party. Read the text. Matthew took some of the money he had robbed from the people and said, I'm going to throw a party, and I'm going to invite all these people to come to my party. And the only people that would come to Matthew's party were the people that looked like him. They were crooks. They were extortioners. There were people that had been oppressing the people. He probably had a room full of publicans, but that's the only way they would have an opportunity. So Matthew is able to reach the people that he knew, and they came to his house. And he created one of the greatest controversies in Jesus' ministry. His ministry starts out in controversy. And that's with Galilee when he takes the Isaiah scroll and says, wait a minute, God is not obligated to work with y'all. Y'all don't have no monopoly on him because y'all can trace y'all genealogy and ancestry back to Abraham. The God really is an equal opportunity. God is whoever comes to him that can come and whoever has faith to believe. That caused a problem. Got him ran out of his home, hometown. Now this causes another problem because now the holy man is at a party. And I'm going to guarantee you they had some spirits and it wasn't unfermented grape juice either. They had the real stuff. They threw a real party, and all these people came, and the religious leaders got bent out of shape. Verse 29 of Luke chapter 5, Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why are y'all hanging out with the riffraff? Why are y'all hanging out with these people out there that's living these immoral lives and smoking and drinking and snorting and dipping and all this other stuff and running around and carousing? 
Why are y'all hanging out with them? And that shows you how far away from the heart of God the religious leaders had become. They had no compassion for the people that was held hostage by their sin, by their addiction, by their habit. And the reason they had no compassion, they knew that they had a religion that was impotent, that couldn't do nothing to help the people, and they didn't want their share of religion to be exposed. And so they had a religion that they only reached out to the people who were just like them, who had sins of the heart and sins of the mind, and who were not addicted to these external vices, not realizing that God is concerned about the heart and the mind. And then Jesus responds by simply saying this. Those who are well do not need a doctor, but those who are sick. Now, the only people who go to see a doctor when they're well, notwithstanding your annual checkup, but if you just go to a doctor just to be gone, you just want to go and go to it, something wrong with you. I mean, you're, something is wrong with you. They got a name they call it. They, they call it that. Something wrong with you because I tell y'all before, they practice it. And so if you just keep going, well, he or she might conclude something wrong with you. And they might decide to practice on this mysterious illness that you have and just practice on you. So Jesus, don't, they with your whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I came to call the despised and the rejection to repentance and salvation. He shows that his vision is for the despised. I close this morning with a, a story I, I shared with you once before. But I was back home in the week with my cousin whose aunt is in the hospital, and I saw another good friend of mine that we grew up together, uh, the horse, Brother Greg, Vincent Calloway, one of the funniest guys I've ever known, one of my best friends in life. I knew him ever since I was five years old. And uh, he would tell this story, so if you ever come to him, I'm going to tell you all the story before he can tell it. So it's a true story. I'm going to confess my sins. We'll be playing marble, and... Uh, Back then, that was your first entrance into gambling. You played for keeps. You played for fun. That was a game. You played for keeps. And whoever won got to keep the marbles, right, when you played the marbles games. So we'd be playing, we'd playing marbles. And I was real small. I was real fast. And we were playing, and I had some kind of raggedy marbles, you know. And they went and bought their new marbles. They had them cat eyes. They was pretty. And it was pretty marbles. They, they put all the marbles, they drew the circle, and everybody put the marbles in, and I put my raggedy marbles in. And then when they turned around, I grabbed all the marbles and ran. <laughs> I grabbed all the marbles and headed for McDonald Hill. We were down there in Vincent's house, right on Mound Street. I grabbed all the marbles. By the time they turned around, I was across the railroad tracks. <laughs> and I was heading up the mountain. Vincent always tell that story about me taking all their brand new marbles. <laughs> we had great times, just great and wonderful times. And so by the time I got in high school, you know, back then, you know, the, the bragging rights, you know, was who's the best football player, who's the best basketball player, and the best you get to be the captain. And so up in the little neighborhood, out in the stadium terrace, the older guys were kind of moving off the scene, so it became my time to be the fastest gun in the West. So I became the captain. So when it came time to choosing sides, uh, brother Terrell, I would choose my younger brother and his classmates and his friends, little old people, right? I would choose them to be on my team. And I would let my good friend Lamont Penn, his brother Wayne Penn, I let them have all the older guys. Now, my motivation was not pure. It was evil. My motivation basically was to earn bragging rights. And that I wanted to be the best. And if I knew if I played really hard, I would get better. But to play really hard, I have to give them an advantage. And so I'd take these little guys, and we would beat them. I would beat them routinely. And would go to school the next day and wear them out. 
all day. Beat y'all with the scruff the tooth. Beat y'all with the elementary age. Y'all ain't nothing about it's just just bragging, just braggadocious. Just and that's the only reason I did it. That's the only reason I would do it. And I would brutalize them with it. You go 40 years later, 40 years, I'm up at Wirtz Avenue at the Holiness Church there. And the Glorious Church asked me to come up there to preach. And I almost went deaf because they sit me beside that speaker. My goodness, it was loud. Woo! My head was ringing. But I can't think of his first name. My cousin Belinda know him. We called him Nene. That's what we called him. He's one of my brother's best friends, right? We called him Nene. Right now, he, he now pastors the church. They just called him the pastor church on Words Avenue. So he was down from Mount Hope, and they were having a big celebration in Charles. True story. So he get up to, to introduce me, and here's what he said. He says, the thing that means the most to me that I can say about Reverend Watts is that he was always for the underdog when we was growing up as a kid. He's when they chose the teams, the bigger guys didn't want us, but he would choose us to be on his team. And he said, and we believed we could win because we had him. And we would give our heart, we would pour everything into it because we didn't want to let him down. And we didn't want to let him lose. The spirit of God, I was slain right there 40 years later. I never gave them no credit. I did tell them y'all played good when I was talking to them. But once I, I talked about what, everything I did, they, I just had the scrubs. And I thought about that thing. They gave me everything they had. They wanted to win because they wanted to be proud of me. And they would do stuff that I didn't think they could do. And I thought about that since then, every now and then. We can't do nothing by ourselves. If we're going to do anything that is significant, that is meaningful, that has eternal consequence, we got to have somebody to help us, somebody to assist us, somebody to encourage us, somebody to pray for us, somebody to hold our hands up when we get tired and weary, someone to say a kind word. And sometimes the people that can help us the most are the substitutes, the people that Jesus talked about right here that we don't think got nothing to offer, who don't think they can do anything significant, but they say we're going to give our all because we want to be a part of something that is meaningful and that is significant and that is consequential. And so they say we ain't got nothing to lose, so we're going to go all in. We're going to go all in. And that's why I'm grateful to the Lord to pastor this church because we got some kids here and some of them come from tough situations and they don't have, they were born with the wrong zip code, somebody would say, and in a single female-headed household and with not a lot of the resources and so forth. But you, this church, y'all pour yourself into these kids and you teach them and you feed them and you take them places and you buy them clothes and in so doing it, you're telling them that they matter and they count. And my prayer is they will realize that somebody believed in me and the Grace Bible Church chose to invest in me. Now, I want to do my best because I want to make them proud. I want to make them proud, and they become our legacy. So, yes, that's why we stand up and try to fight for what's right, and we stand up against the Charles Nerva Newell Authority if they're going to pass plans that are illegal and not invest in rebuilding the community like they're supposed to. We have to stand up because somebody got to stand up and give voice to the pain of those who can't give it voice to themselves. And that's why we got to go to the state school superintendent and the legislature and say, wait a minute, it's not right, it is not fair and just for you to over-discipline our children, excessively discipline our children, suspend our children, and put our children out of school because you don't, not, you don't like them. We know some of them are bad. They ain't that bad. That they're suspended twice that everybody else is suspended. They're not that bad that they're being denied what we believe is a constitutional right to a free, thorough, and efficient education. And so I testified this week before the Legislative uh, House Education Committee. The, the room was packed. And I stood up there, and they looked at me and said, we didn't know nothing about that. We didn't know that 
that in some counties, 60% of the black kids are disciplined. 22% of them are suspended from school during the school year. We didn't know that. We didn't know that 20,000 children are suspended from the public school system in West Virginia every single year. We didn't know that. And I said, that's why I'm here. You ought to know it. As the legislators, you ought to know it. And I went to the Culture Center and found reports from 1976, Sister Regina, 1976, the Western Department of uh, uh, the State Department of Human Rights developed a report in 76 and said this is a problem. Richard in 1980, this is a problem. University of Pennsylvania, its report in 2015, this is a problem. Listen, West Virginia is one of 13 states in the South that had this problem. And for five years, we've been talking to the state school superintendent, the county superintendent, and they've done nothing. So we went to the, to the, to the state superintendent last month and said, we're going to the legislature. Now, why are we doing it? Because it's the right thing to do. And people, they laugh at me and make fun of me. I say, I'm, I ain't mad at you. I'm not angry with you. But that woman in Luke chapter 18, y'all remember her, don't you? This poor widow woman had been unjustly, she'd been done unjustly and unfairly. And she went to the circuit judge. He said, I ain't got no time to be deal with no women. They have no stand in the court. We're not going to hear her case. We're not going to put it on the docket. And she showed up every single day demanding justice. She would not be silent. They said, go on, woman. The judge not going to talk to you. Get on wait for me. He ain't got no time to talk to you. And finally, the Bible says he was unjust. He was unfair. He didn't respect people. He had no concern for nobody. But finally, he put his robe on, came back and say, bring her up in here. She is worrying me to death. She's worrying out my last nerve. I'm going to render a decision here in her favor. I just don't want to see her no more. I just don't want her to come back here no more. And sometimes that's what we got to do. We got to have the right issue, be on the right side, have God on our side, and keep on crying out, this is not fair, this is not just. These people deserve to be treated better than this. And as I close, I really got the legislators' attention when I said, well, let me tell you something. There are 270,000 children in the schools in the state of West Virginia. 90% of them are Caucasian. Let's get that straight. 90% are Caucasian. So 18,000 Caucasian children are being suspended every year. And they're creating a pipeline from the schoolyards to the juvenile halls to the prison hall. So the majority of the people in prison in West Virginia are poor whites. You know, blacks are overrepresented, don't get me wrong. We're overrepresented, but the majority, 87% of all the people in prison, are poor white people. Blacks make about 11% of the prison population. And so then some of these senators, uh, legislators really kind of looked at me, you know, oh. They realized that my county you know, yes, your county and most of the kids that are suspended are white and they're poor. And they've been put on the prison, uh, to the, from the schoolyard to the prison yard pipeline. So this is how this thing fleshes itself out, I believe, in real time. We try to find where there's pain, that people are experiencing pain. We try to respond to that pain in a way that affirms their dignity and show that they have value and worth and that God is concerned about people. And by doing that, we credential ourselves as a continuation of the life of Christ. And we earn the right to be heard. That's all I'm saying. We earn the right to then to talk to them about their soul. We earn the right to then talk to them about their need to know Jesus Christ and God is concerned about them. I think that's what the church is going to have to do in the 21st century if we're going to have the type of relevance that we need to have to have the influence that the society needs for us to, to have. There's not a single problem that we have in our country today that we have a solution for. We just go from the next problem to the next problem. Not that we solve any of them, but there are solutions. And I think that those solutions have a spiritual component to it. It has a way of nurturing the soul of people and helping people get their humanity back. And the church is the only institution that is divinely ordained and commissioned, I believe, and that is endued with the power of God to be that healing bond that is so desperately needed.
And I pray by God's grace that God will use us. I'm an older man now. I'm not old. A young man that inspired me when he told me he didn't think I was a 46. So he's really inspired. I'm, I'm inspired today. I'm, he said he looked like I was only 46, right? That means about the same age as, uh, as my brother right here. So, uh, I know better now. I ain't no fool. I know he's trying to fly to me. I understand that. But I'm encouraged. Why not us? Why not now? Why not in this neighborhood, in this community, is one of the most despised in the state of West Virginia? What if the Spirit of the Lord falls upon us? And what if we catch Jesus' 2020 spiritual vision and we by faith try to move to do the type things he was doing? And what if change starts to come from Nazareth of Galilee of the 21st century? What if the children of the Grace Bible Church, what if they start becoming top kids in the school? Lowest disciplinary rates. Lowest suspension rates. What if they become the model citizens? And people start to realize, well, well how are those kids? They're in the same neighborhood going to the same schools. That's what the church has to be. We have to produce something that is different from what is being produced ordinarily to bring attention to the fact of the Jesus fact. And not only the Jesus factor, the fact of the local church, this community and household of faith, these caring, nurturing people, and their input in the lives of children and families, it makes a difference and it changes the trajectory of those families. And if you influence enough, you change the trajectory of a whole neighborhood. Why not us? Why not now? Why not here? that we could not witness a great move of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's start for prayer, shall we? Father, we're so grateful for another day that you've granted us to be here. We thank for all these wonderful men and women and boys and girls of the Grace Bible Church. And the vast majority have already put their faith in you, and for that we're grateful and thankful. Pray that you bless them and encourage them. If there's someone who come in our sanctuary today who never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that they will clearly understand that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us fell into one of those categories of being poor, materially or spiritually brokenhearted, captive, held hostage, spiritually blind, bruised, demon possessed in the wrong way, physically or spiritually diseased, Lord, defiled in some way, defective and despised. But Jesus still loves us. He died on the cross for us, shed his blood as the payment for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. I pray that they might hear that good news and might say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's someone here today, maybe you, you're here today for the first time you've heard this story about Jesus Christ. God loves you. He sent Jesus to die on the cross in your place to take the punishment that you and I deserve. The punishment by our sin. That punishment was placed upon him. He died as a sin bearer. He died as a substitutionary sacrificial lamb of God. But he was raised from the dead on the third